Hi guys, welcome back to another lecture in OPD Essential series in which we will discuss approach to dyspepsia. So once you start sitting in general medicine OPD, especially in a government setup, you will find dyspepsia as one of the most common complaints by which patients present. So dyspepsia basically refers to indigestion characterized by recurrent or chronic upper abdominal pain or discomfort or fullness with common symptoms being early satiety, bloating, nausea and vomiting. While sitting in OPD, you all will realize that it is a fairly common complaint occurring in as much as 20% of the population. Now here I am talking about general population, not only the patients who are visiting OPD. Every now and then, someone will ask you to give medicines for dyspepsia, be it some patients, attendants, your ward boy or other staff. Now when we consider the etiology, it can be divided into two types. So 20 to 25 percent of the cases are due to some organic cause, while in 75 to 80 percent of the cases, no organic cause is identifiable and it is termed as functional dyspepsia. The various organic causes of dyspepsia include peptic ulcer disease, H. pylori gastritis, GRD, use of drugs like NSAIDs, glucocorticoids, calcium channel blockers, then potassium supplements, iron preparations, etc. These all drugs can also lead to dyspepsia. Then biliary pain, inflammatory bowel disease, chronic pancreatitis, these patients can present with dyspepsia, malabsorption disorders like lactose intolerance, celiac disease, certain GI malignancies including esophageal cancer, gastric carcinoma, pancreatic carcinoma and certain non-GI causes like myocardial infarction, pneumonia etc. So these all are the organic causes which can present with dyspepsia, features of dyspepsia like chronic upper abdominal pain, discomfort, early satiety, bloating etc. Now functional dyspepsia as we have discussed accounts for majority of cases and is a diagnosis of exclusion. We have to rule out organic causes first then we can label it as functional dyspepsia. So there is a Rome 4 diagnostic criteria which suggests that there should be no structural disease including upper GI endoscopy as investigation along with any one of the following. So this is the criteria for functional dyspepsia. So along with no structural disease on investigations, if the patient is complaining of bothersome postprandial fullness, bothersome early satiety or epigastric pain or burning sensation. So any of this if present will be making the diagnosis of functional dyspepsia. So as we are sitting in the OPD, time is limited. So whatever we ask should be relevant. So points in relevant history include history of Hartman or regurgitation which can be suggestive of gastroesophageal reflux disease leading to reflux esophagitis. We have to ask the history of medications the patient is taking. So importantly NSAIDs, glucocorticoids, then calcium channel blockers, potassium supplements, iron supplements all can lead to dyspepsia. Then episodic pain in epigastrium right upper quadrant can be suggestive of cholelithiasis. So this can be suggestive of cholelithiasis and for the diagnosis we will advise sonography of abdomen. Now we have to particularly ask about certain red flag and alarming features. These include significant unintentional weight loss, presence of anorexia, persistent vomiting, dysphagia, odynophagia, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, family history of GI malignancy or any palpable mass or lymphadenopathy. So any of these red flag features if present then we will have to consider the evaluation of malignancy. So we have to definitely ask each and every patient about these alarming or red flag features for in the patient who is presenting with dyspepsia. Now role of physical examination is limited and will be positive in case of some organic causes. So if epigastric tenderness is present then we can test for carnet sign to distinguish whether the pain is originating from abdominal wall or there is visceral pain. 
So in Carnet sign, what we do is we ask the patient to tense the abdominal muscles by lifting the upper half of the body from supine position. Now, if the tenderness increases, then it is abdominal wall pain, pain originating from abdominal wall. While if the tenderness decreases while uh, lifting the upper half of the, of the body, then it is visceral pain. Then the ori origin of pain is from the viscera. Similarly, we can ask the patient to perform Murphy sign in case of acute cholecystitis. Localized tenderness can be present in right hypochondrium, in liver abscess and in other areas according to the organ involved. So what all investigations we will advise in a patient presenting with dyspepsia? So we will advise routine investigations like CBC, liver function test, then amylase and lipase to rule out any pancreatic disorder, iron studies and stool occult blood to rule out any GI chronic blood loss which can be suggestive of any underlying malignancy. Now what are the indications for upper GI endoscopy? So each and every patient who is aged more than equal to 60 years, upper GI endoscopy is mandatory with or without gastric biopsy. If the uh, gastroenterologist uh, has a suspicion of any lesion, he will also take the gastric biopsy. Then significant unintentional weight loss that is more than 5% of body weight within 6 to 12 months. This is the definition of significant weight loss. If this significant weight loss is unintentional, then also we will uh, do upper GI endoscopy. If there is overt GI bleeding, more than one red flag or alarming features which we have already discussed in the previous slide or any rapidly progressive alarming feature. So these all are the indications of upper GI endoscopy and we will refer the patient to gastroenterologist. gastroenterologist. Now coming on to the management. So first and foremost thing is we have to rule out any organic disease. So suppose we have performed endoscopy and organic disease is seen on endoscopy be it peptic ulcer disease, reflux esophagitis or any malignancy. So directly we will refer this patient to gastroenterologist, gastroenterologist referral. Secondly, if the organic disease is not ob observed on endoscopy, then what will we do? We will do the gastric biopsy to confirm the presence of H. pylori. If it is present, then we will treat for H. pylori infection and then we will confirm the eradication. If it is absent, we will treat this as functional dyspepsia. In later slides, we will see in detail how to treat functional dyspepsia. If endoscopy for some reason cannot be performed, if the facility is not available, then we can confirm H. pylori by stool antigen testing or urea bread test. So this can also be done for making its diagnosis. Now, if suppose H. pylori is positive, how can we treat H. pylori? So a commonly used regimen is a triple drug regimen in which we use proton pump inhibitor like S-omeprazole, usual doses 40 milligram BD, then amoxicillin 1 gram BD, and clarithromycin 500 milligram BD. This has to be given for total 14 days. Now after the treatment has been completed, we will confirm eradication of H. pylori after 4 weeks of completion of treatment. So this can be confirmed by either urea bread test, stool antigen or we can also perform endoscopy with gastric biopsy. But for confirmation of eradication, this endoscopy is rarely performed, we can do directly urea bread test or stool antigen test. Okay, so once we have ruled out organic causes, we are left with functional dyspepsia which is a much common entity. Now as we discussed the criteria of functional dyspepsia, there should be no structural disease evidence including on upper GI endoscopy plus there should be any one of the following like bothersome postprandial fullness, early satiety, epigastric pain, epigastric burnness. And this symptom duration should be more than three months. Now, how to manage functional dyspepsia? So basically, we start with a proton pump inhibitor trial for four to eight weeks. Now, we advise the patient to take this PPI empty stomach in early morning. It has to be taken 30 to 60 minutes prior to meal. If symptoms improve, this PPI can be continued for six to 12 months. 
Now suppose the patient is coming back to you after 8 to 12 weeks, even after giving the PPI, there is no improvement in symptoms. Then we will discontinue this PPI and start the patient on tricyclic antidepressants for 8 to 12 weeks. So even after 8 to 12 weeks of PPI trial, if the patient's symptoms are not improving, we will start the patient on TCA. So example include amitriptyline, which can be given in a dose of 10 to 75 milligram at bedtime. If symptoms improve, this TCA can again be continued for 6 months and then we have to discontinue it after 6 months. If the patient still have persistent symptoms despite the TCA trial, we will discontinue the TCA and initiate the patient on prokinetics for 4 weeks. So prokinetics like Domperidon, 10 mg TDS or Levosulpride, 25 mg TDS can be given to such patients in whom TCA is also not responding. Even after the prokinetics fail, then we will evaluate the symptoms, evaluate gastric emptying, etc. Now it is important to counsel the patients regarding the use of PPI as well as tricyclic antidepressants. These drugs will take at least few weeks to start their action. So for immediate relief, we can ask the patient to take some antacids containing aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide. There are certain oxythazines preparations containing antacids like mucane gel, which helps in immediate relief in patients of GRD and heartburn. Then we can advise use of sucralfit syrup which acts as a gastroprotective agent in patients of peptic ulcer disease. Also, one of the most important thing for treatment of dyspepsia, be it organic or functional, is lifestyle modifications. We ask the patient to not lie on bed just after eating. We ask the patient to walk for 15 to 20 minutes after having any meal like lunch and dinner. Then we ask the patients to not take tea or coffee at the bedtime. Then the head end of the bed should be elevated to 15 to 20 degree. All these are some of the lifestyle modifications. Also, we ask the patient to lose some weight if he is overweight or obese. So this is all about the treatment of dyspepsia and OPD. I hope you like this lecture and you are liking this series. Kindly subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much.